your stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. Many of my clients reach out to me because they're in transition. Their children are hitting milestone ages. They want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday. And they want to develop clarity about their natural strengths, what their next adventure might look like. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shaped their lives, stories that uncover patterns and may unveil insights into dissatisfaction and also where their strengths lie and where they found and continue to find joy. This podcast's intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering the internal messages that are limiting their success and discovering how to shift their stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, visit elkinsconsulting.com and schedule a one-time 90-minute StrengthsFinder session. I'm so eager to have this conversation with Lester Young today. Um, we met via LinkedIn and I can't remember who shared your post saying, let's get the word out about this man. Uh, but I, as soon as I saw your profile, I needed to talk to you. So Lester Young, thank you so much for joining me on Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. Thank you. And I, I love that statement. I really do. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> thank you for the invite. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, well, before we get started, I, you know, I normally have a specific question I ask, but I'm curious what that statement means to you, why it stands out, what, why it's meaningful. I mean, for me, it's like, you know, being being someone who made some really bad mistakes in his life at a very young age um, from being sentenced to prison um, at the age of 19 um, for murder and to be uh, served a total of 22 years and five months in a prison system. I truly believe my mistakes doesn't define the man that I am today. I'm a 49 year old man with a different different level of thinking, a different worldview than I had at 19 years old. So that's why it really resonates with me more so. And I think that it's important that others see that we're not tied to the mistakes that we are, but we definitely can evolve and transform our lives into being different people um, from these mistakes or the adversity that we experience. So that's why it means uh, uh, I like that statement. Oh, I love it. I haven't heard it in those words before, but I just got a little chill of my spine because um, the reason that this title came to be for my book and my podcast was a woman who has MS. Mm. And she was telling me that she, she didn't want to talk about her MS when she was doing her public speaking yeah. because she was afraid that people would see her as that woman with MS, that her illness would define her. And I said, it's not the illness that's defining you. It's how you talk about it. It's how you, how you overcome it and your your resilience. Cause when I hear her stories, I think of resilience and, and strength and integrity. I don't think, Oh, sickness. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that this is coming from a completely different place. And um, I knew the moment you opened your mouth, we were going to have a great conversation. So yeah. that said, let's go with that first question that I always ask my guests. I'd love to hear um, something about you that most people might not know, something that's not on your bio or in your book. What do you think? Uh, what's the thing that most people don't know about me? I'm an introvert. <laughs> I'm a very shy person, but I would come off as an extrovert, uh, someone who is really that social butterfly person, but I'm not. I'm a person that I know I have to show up in spaces because I believe that my story matters. So by me being allowing my introverted part of me to prevent me, prevent others from trans being transported. So I'm more of an introvert. I would rather be chilling by myself. But I believe that my story matters to a point where I have to lean into my discomfort to share my story, to interact so that I can help empower and transport others from the message that I receive from my story. Wow. Yeah, I think that might surprise people. <laughs> You're more of an introvert. <laughs> like, leave me alone. But, you know, when, yeah, we just have, all of us have a purpose in life. So my story, um, going to prison at age of 19 years old and being sentenced to life for killing someone over a drug dispute, that's a story. That's a that's a story of redemption, a story of resilience, a story of guilt, a story of, of just feeling like, you know, um, you you deserve the same thing. You don't deserve to be alive. Right. 
And mm-hmm. it's a story of just walking every day with a level of guilt, knowing that you did what you did. And it wasn't, it was something with, had, it didn't require that behavior or response, right? So you live with that. So people would say that a person go to prison or took another human being life that they deserve to be. And I get that. I understand that. And that's the thing that I wrestled with for a long time in prison. But again, my my choices does not define the man that I have evolved into, right? We live in a society Mm -hmm. where we hold a person to a mistake that they made at 17 years old. My thinking isn't the same. My worldview isn't the same. So that's where I'm at now is like, I just believe that I have to lean every day into my discomfort to tell my story, to change Mm -hmm. the narrative that people may have about someone uh, who committed a violent crime such as murder, like, you know, put them in the stakes and let them burn. I get it. I understand why somebody feel like that, but let me help you think differently. Let me show you the person who went to prison at 19 reading at a seventh grade level of education. And it came a point in my life where I realized what I did was wrong. And I made every day a day of investing in me. You know, every day was a day of changing the narrative that my environment, my peers gave me, telling me that I wasn't anything. I wasn't this. I wasn't this. But no one ever told me that I had a skill. No one told me that I'm I'm gifted. I never heard those words until I was in prison. And one of the prison chaplains um, heard me speak one day and he called me into his office and he said he said that you have something unique and different about you. He said, no one has ever walked into this chapel and able to control and keep people at an attention, 400 men in prison at their full, giving them their undivided attention. He said, you have a gift, you have a gift. And that was my first time hearing that. That was a seed that was planted in me. And I remember cultivating, and not only did he stop there and telling me that story, about my gift and planted that seed, he also helped me cultivate it, right? How did he so, do that? Say what again? Did he, how did he do that? What did he do? He, he started, the said. chaplain started mentoring me. I started getting mentored by the chaplain. You know, um, it was not a, just a relationship, an inmate and a chaplain. He started seeing me as a human being. He started seeing me with a gift. He started seeing something in me. Like I said, I went to prison at a seventh grade level education. He was one of the ones that gave me a book. I never read a book in my life. You know, um, was a high school dropout. And he gave me this book by James Allen, As a Man Thinker, So Is He. And that, again, was the book that helped change the narrative for me. Like, I realized that the mind is a garden, right? And whatever you plant in that garden will grow. So, and I had to be the farmer of my own mind, something I gave that power to everyone else except for me. What was everyone the book else. again? James Allen, as a man thinker, so is he. It's a small book. It's been around a long time. But for me, it was a profound book because it shows that, as I said, every one of us are a farmer or a gardener of our own minds. We mm-hmm. have the control to cultivate and plant the seeds in our own mind. But unfortunately for me, as a young person, I gave that to someone else. I allowed my environment to sprinkle whatever seed that, that they thought I should have because I did not have the ability. I didn't have the the self-awareness and the self-worth to be able to speak for myself and to realize that I have to become my own gardener. What I put into my mind will grow as a man thinker. So is he. So that's okay. where I, that's where he began to help me in that process. And when I was able to process it from that perspective and over a course of time, there was always that challenge of how do you fight the old narrative that you had on replay for the last 10 years? <laughs> like oh, old that is so hard. Right. It's, it's yeah, like yeah. A, a record stuck on repeat. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's where yeah. it was. Wow. So are you still in contact with that minister? Absolutely. With that chaplain? Yes, I yeah. am. So, I mean, yeah. because he's a lifetime, uh, you know, I see him as a father figure, even though I will have my father in my life um, before he passed and father passed away uh, last year. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, this this particular chaplain, his name is Chaplain uh, Gerald Patoka um, at Kershaw. You know, I had various chaplains, but Chaplain Patoka was like that last chaplain in the in the in the process where I had about eight years left in prison and I met him. And Chaplain Batoka was the one that continued to cultivate that seed in me. He was like, yo, you have it, man. You you have something and I'm going to bring you into this chapel and I'm going to teach you 
and I'm going to mentor you. You know, um, I'm going to show you how to do these classes. You know, he didn't, I want to show you how to do PowerPoint presentations because right. <laughs> <laughs> I already had the gift, you know. So, yeah, that's how it is to this day. Um, um, so okay. Now I, I'd love to hear um, the moment that you realized you could pay that forward. Who was the person when you think of your that influence and how you were able to plant that seed for somebody else? Who was that person? No need for names, but I, I, that story. With you, I don't really I have the by the I'm so thankful to God that he allowed me to pay it forward, you know, and it's crazy. I remember watching this movie in prison um, that, again, this chaplain brought in. It's, it's actually a movie called Pay It Forward. And that was yeah. my first time watching this 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 whole what he, Chaplin taught me is about the law of reciprocity and the law of paying it forward. So I remember watching that. I can't give you a specific name. And I knew I know that those years I was in prison, I was standing before groups of men every day in prison, pouring into them, helping them cultivate. I go. I just left a prison today. One of the same prison I was housed at. I went in today and taught my book, The Five Stages of Incarceration, a book that I taught for 18 years in prison. I go back to this day and teach this book. I've published this book now and I go back in and teach it. So one of the, the topics for today was what is freedom? And we define freedom is, 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 is I drew this box and, and asked them, is the man in the box or the man outside the box have freedom? Most of the people said the man outside the box have freedom. I beg to differ. The man inside the box has freedom when they, again, define who they are. When they understand forgiveness is the thing that frees you from a prison of anguish, right? So watching these men, it was like 40 men in this, in this group and watching them process it. I know then, just like every other time I'm meeting, I know then that I pass that forward. I'm paying it forward because now they're going back in their units. They're thinking about it and they're sharing it. So it's almost like I'm spreading and paying it forward on multiple levels. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, the reason I ask that is because I know that um, I, I have lots of coaching clients that I have loved and I know it, it's made a difference for them. But like just recently, I saw somebody that I had worked with. She had hired me for an event when she was in her, she was like 22 running this program. And she hired me for this event and we kept in touch via Facebook. Well, she just enlisted. And I remember seeing something on Facebook about this enlistment and her new address for basic training. And I thought, you know, I bet she could use a little card. So I wrote her a note, stuck it in the mail. And on Saturday, I got a letter back from her. Yeah. saying that that card was meaningful to her and thanking me. I mean, so as much as I know that I have this broad reach to a certain extent, I know that I've planted seeds. That's the good stuff. Like getting this one letter back saying that what I did made a difference for this human, for this woman that I know is going to make a difference for thousands of others. So that's why I asked that question. That's a good one. When you said it like that, I'm just thinking about this guy. Um, his name is Gary Robinson. I, he's fine. We mentioned his name, right? I met Gary in prison in 2000, 2000 early 2000s. And Gary came to the prison um, young, had a bunch of time in prison. But I saw something in him just like the prison chaplain saw in me, right? But at this time, I was already in prison. My mindset was completely different. I was doing a lot of just giving back and teaching. And I saw something in him. And and he got out of prison. Um, he's been out of prison about eight, nine years now. And he wrote this book called The Mining, the Diamond in You. Right. And one of the things that he acknowledged in his book is how my mentorship doing the incarceration helped him to this day. Um, actually, we just left from um, Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia this weekend. We was in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, uh, we drove together, been in prison together. Now we drive into this conference, a speaker's conference. And we, I'm still mentoring him. And I see, I see that he has all of the right things in him. You know what I'm saying? Like that conversation we had years ago in prison, I can see the fruits of that. Right. And I see a lot of people just like really just, I just thought about him. And now it's like, we get on mastermind calls, you know, weekly and I'm um, helping him still to this day, like figure out this whole thing about giving back. So he's now doing a program inside another facility. And I'm looking to build that relationship that we're going to now go back into a prison 
Um, I just spoke to one of the prison chaplains about him that I want to now take him with me back into a prison because his story is just as relevant as my story. So when I think about what you just mentioned, I think about a guy like Gary, who's now doing some phenomenal work. And we still do mastermind sessions that we did in prison. We didn't know what mastermind groups were. We just knew that we were back <laughs> off each other. Now they have a title for it, mastermind group. So we do create these type of conversations around picking each other apart and building a business that we can continue to pour into the men inside of the South Carolina prisons. That's awesome because it's sustainable. It's it's sustainable. One of the things that I read when or I've heard and I've I've been reading a lot about neuroplasticity, your how your brain can change and how we can rewire our brains in positive ways or negative ways. And one of the things that is very clear is that we have to do it in a sustainable way if we're going to be believed. So if if you want somebody to believe that you have truly changed, that you are not the same person, the same stories still exist in your history, but you the way that you perceive them and the way that you are perceiving yourself has taken dramatic turns. Mm. So how do you sustain that? Like one of my best friends, she said, sir, you can't be a prophet in your own town. Basically saying that people who know you are going to have a really hard time believing that you've changed. Right. So how do you do that? How do you deal with that? For me, I don't, you know, I don't stay in the same area. I moved when I got out of prison. I moved to a place called Columbia, South Carolina. I'm not originally from Columbia. I'm from originally from Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. It's maybe a two and a half hour drive from here. But um, being in this area here, I don't know anyone. No one knows me other than the story that I tell them. And that story is that I'm a formerly incarcerated person, did 22 years in prison. I'll let that be known. I lead with that in everything that I do. But because of consistency and I'm tied to something bigger than bigger than myself, that allows me to stay consistent even when those in the community may not give me an opportunity. You know, um, I remember walking out of prison um, with this burning desire to help save our youth from incarceration. And here it is, I'm in this town where I just got out of prison. I'm still dealing with my own, my own stuff. Of right, people. of course. All that stuff and being free, but I still had this passion in my heart to help young people. So I remember like going into barbershops and beauty salons, grocery stores, passing out flyers about, hey, I got this uh, free event in the library, which I could not pay for. So I had to find a space where the library gave it to me for free. And I'm calling and say, hey, come on, let me help your kids share my stories so hopefully can prevent your kids from going to prison. People looking at me like, who are you? Right. And I remember no one showed up for this event. And I was like, I felt I felt like bad, dejected. You know, you do this thing and no one shows up like, oh, well, I guess that was a uh, give me a reason to not do it. But because I was tied to a purpose. And that's the thing that I tell people is that no matter how much the rejection is in respect, you may not receive. If you're tied to a person, I mean, purpose, you're going to create a level of consistency. The consistency is going to create the momentum. And eventually you're going to change the hearts and minds of the people. And that's what I did for the last seven years. So now I throw an event. I have like now two, 300 people want to come to this event because they see the consistency. They remember that guy just got out of prison, putting a flyer up. Now they know who I am just because of my presence. So that's what I tell people is how do you prove that is that you have to make sure that whatever you need, you're tied to something bigger than you, bigger than a dollar amount, Mm -hmm. bigger than a plaque, bigger than a a, a notice of recognition, because some people are not going to see you when you're in your trenches. People are not going to see that. And this is where you're molding shape in your trenches to stay consistent because you're passionate about whatever that you do. That's why I do what I do to this day. That I, I have this image in my head of you walking into barber shops and putting up these little flyers and talking to the people in the library. Can I rent your space? How would can I do that for free? And I can and I also imagined you standing at that room all by yourself yeah, waiting for people to show weird. up. Because I came from an environment like prison where I thought I hold classes. I'm talking to three, four hundred guys in prison, but that's an audience that they don't have any distraction. They go, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a constraint, right? <laughs> You're in the box you with them. Here. You come out here in the community and you have a passion for something and you feel that you're doing purpose work and people don't understand the value because they don't know who you are. 
And I remember this guy um, pulled me to the side one time at a networking event because of going back again, I'm an introvert, but I know that my passion requires me to be an extrovert. So I'm leaning into networking events where it was about how do I build relationships? And the guy told me, he's like, hey, man, what you're struggling with, people don't know who you are. And I was like, OK, what is that? How do I do? He said people in this town. How do I fix that? Right. Yeah, and he said people do business with people they have relationships with. So he said, you have to build relationships with people. You may want to serve them, but you can't serve unless you build relationships. So that's when I start. I had to reverse engineer. I was like, OK, this is what I have to do. I have to I have to be there to build the relationships. And how do I do that is by there's a book I remember he gave me said never eat alone. That was his book. Mm. His book. He says, read this book and you will realize that anytime you're seeking to grow and you build relationships. He said, if you're going for a cup of coffee, don't go by yourself. Like call, that's the opportunity to say, hey, I got 15 minutes, let's go eat. Like we linked in, we made this connection on LinkedIn. This is how you build a relationship with people. And this is how you get your message out. And that person helps become your vision pusher, right? Mm-hmm. Build a relationship yeah. with people by not eating alone, having a coffee drink. I'm having this, sharing my story with you on this podcast. My story resonates with you. You resonate, you share the story with someone else. And now there may be a room that I may never be able to get into get into ever ever but you hearing my story your audience hearing my story now you become my vision pusher you push my vision to the next person and the next person and the next mm-hmm. person and get me into rooms that i may never be able to get into right and that's all about relationship building and that's what i had to realize when i got out of prison i wanted to serve but i didn't have the relationships so i built the relationships and now i can serve yes you're preaching <laughs> I've I, well, I've been, I should say you're preaching to the choir because that's something that I've been talking about for decades. It, you have to have a relationship with somebody before they're going to trust you enough to let you serve them, mm-hmm. no matter how genuine and authentic your purpose is until they, until they know you. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever read the go giver by Bob Berg? No. Um, that's another one that really talks about having that purpose understanding that the more you give, the more people understand what your purpose is. And the reason that popped into my head was at some point, and I don't remember if it's in the book or in my interview with him, he said, you, by doing what you're doing, you're developing a, an army of ambassadors, Oh yeah, an army of walking ambassadors for your purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that vision is so uh, vivid for me, this whole idea of the more you build these relationships and and let them understand you at that vulnerable level of of serving, of wanting to serve without saying, oh, I just want to help people. I just want to help people. That's talk. Yeah, yeah. When you're building relationships, you really are demonstrating how you're serving people instead of just telling people. You don't have to serve. I've learned you don't serve people always in the front of the room. You can serve people in the back of the room. Right. And I, and that's doing some small things, some simple things where you see a need you serve. So, again, understanding one of the things that I learned from um, Chaplain Patoka um, in prison is he used to always share with me his wins and his losses. But he always just showed share me the wins of the law of reciprocity because he was a servant for the people in prison. God always blessed them with abundant opportunity to help bless the people. Right. So I learned that from him, even like I remember when I got out of prison, when I was unemployed um, for a period of time, I immediately thought about the lessons he taught me about the law of reciprocity until you have something, just continue to give. So two, three weeks out of prison, I started going to a homeless shelter, shelter, you know, and I said I went there and I told the, the, the woman who was over the shelter, I was like, hey, I'm here to help serve. I just got out of prison. Um, so I'm just letting you know. But most importantly, I, I have some downtime. I would like to be able to be a servant to others, right? And it was, and it was in two ways. One, I am doing something to help someone else, but it's also to remind me that even in my lowest period, how I may have felt that someone else doing worse than me. So it was almost in a selfish way, but also in a good way. I need we. I, I serve them, but as I talk to the men and women in that shelter. I realized that 22 years was not the worst thing. There were people who had experienced worse. Here it is. I'm thinking prison was the worst thing ever in my life. But realizing there were people who were literally free that were never free. They were living for 22 years, hungry, homeless, unemployed, sick, et cetera, et cetera. 
that again gave me a different perspective of my life. And I always tell men that I work with when they get out of prison, like go find a way to serve people, not in the front of the room, the back of the room, go, go and feed the homeless people. Like, so that's one of the things that I do in the summer, the wintertime here in Columbia, I collect uh, 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 sleeping bags and food and socks and gloves. And I would get people to know, donate and I would go into the park and give them out. And, but I always want to bring someone who just got out of prison to come with me. So again, that when you be rejected because of that scarlet letter of a felony or a prison, you can think about that man who you gave that sleeping bag to, or that woman you gave that sleeping bag to, that they're sleeping on the ground while you're sleeping in a bed. So you have something to be thankful for. Just remember that there are people who are doing far worse than you, not to look at down on them, but to understand that you are blessed in a lot of ways. So mm. that's, again, how I stay connected and I keep moving in relationships like that. And God provides for you when you serve others rather than the front of the room or the back of the room. So never eat alone is an analogy for everything we do yeah. in your that's life. Right. Never go and give alone. Give never. with others. Share, like my, right. my daughter's six years old now, and, and she's at the point now where she see, I want her to see me give others. So she has mm-hmm. seen a family on the corner that may be in need. She'd be like, Dad, could we help? I want my daughter to develop a level of empathy that she sees that she's here not to have. Like she was, we was just in the store and she had, she said, Dad, I got four jackets. But she said, somebody else don't have none. And that's the mindset I want my daughter to have. It's like, okay, you got four jackets. You're not wearing, you only can wear one. What can you give away? What could you give someone else, right? Mm -hmm. And that's to help her develop this level of empathy, but most importantly, to understand that you're blessed, right? Right. She's not entitled to these things. She happens to have them She's and be grateful for them. Those are lessons I learned. And like I said, that's what I said. So when I'm very like, uh, when I'm articulating my experience as a person who did 22 years in prison for murder, and I share that, I lean into that. And I know some people hear he was in prison for murder, but I want you to hear my story so that you know that my story, I'm not tied to my story. I'm showing you the evolution, the transformation um, that I have went through. So if I tell some people when they hear me talk and I never tell them I've been in prison, they would never believe it. They were bring that out. And I, yeah, right. I sometimes wait until the end of the conversation or I'm doing a presentation, especially a PowerPoint. I walked into all of this deep stuff that they and I and I close with a picture of my prison ID in my story. Wow. Show that <laughs> I judge a person truly by the book. <laughs> you know, so yes. changing that narrative that people may have. So. Yes. Uh, You know, the thing that resonates the most with me about this whole conversation is this whole idea that we can change and that people change. Because I've heard so many people say, oh, people don't change. I think that's bullshit. And, And when you said you were 19 years old, when our older son was 19, he went through some really tough times. I mean, it was a, it was a really shitty year of telling you. And as a parent, I look at this young man who's turning 23 tomorrow. And I see uh, he is still the kid that I helped raise. I mean, yeah. I can't take full credit. This this kid is a pretty amazing young man. Yeah. I can't take full credit. His dad can't take full credit. Um, we can say that our community helped us raise our son to be the, the amazing young man he is today. Yeah. What I can say is that, is this the same kid in terms of his confidence his sense of responsibility, his sense of, of self-reliance and compassion as he was at 19? No. I mean, all of what he went through made him um, more compassionate, but also a much better judge of character. Mm-hmm. He learned so much. So here you are talking about this 19-year-old. That could have been my kid. Mm-hmm. You know, he could have ended up in that situation. So being a parent, I think, puts it in a different perspective. So I'm I guess I'm what I'd love to hear from you is where do you see this whole transformation in terms of being a parent to your child? 
I'm more, again, uh, has helped me develop a level of empathy and understand that people are going to struggle, that my daughter is not going to be this perfect. She's six years old. She's not, she's going to give me hell at 16. <laughs> promise. I promise she will. Yes. <laughs> to be able to give people room for the failure, but help them interpret that failure is not permanent, that a mistake does not, is not a permanent mark on your, on your life. Right. So it's like, OK, you made this mistake, but let's let's learn how to turn this into stepping stones. And from my experience, I know this. I know that my life sentence, I left a lot of guys in prison because they believed that their failure was permanent. And it all started here. Right. Mm. I, I show them through my example that my life sentence, my life sentence, my mistake isn't permanent. I have now the opportunity to define what that permanent looks like, right? So that's what I want. It comes down to being a parent is to have that level of understanding, empathy, but to be able to help my daughter turn any setbacks into greater comebacks by making some great choices. And one starts with the mindset. Two, making investments in herself. Three, uh, what I call the creating that accountability circle. You know, and believing forth, believing in you knowing that you are a human being that will make mistakes. And, but it's what values that is you now taking the time to understand that. So that's what I would do as a parent. That's what I'm doing now as, as she's six years old. And I think that it, my experience, my life experience, allow me to be a better father, a better parent to her because I understand that. You know, I have that level of understanding that, yo, I bet your dad is not some guy who never experienced something. I've been experiencing hardship since I was a teenager myself, right? <laughs> right, right. I think that's where so many parents get caught up in making this mistake that um, they think somehow they made mistakes, but that their care- kids won't. I don't know. I remember when um, I caught my younger son, he had gone out in the middle of the night, like two in the morning. He's 16 years old at the time with a bunch of his friends. And I got this message from one of the parents, one of the other kids, like, well, they did this and my kids are not going to hang out with your kid for a while. And that was really bad influence, blah, blah, blah. And um, my son asked me if he was grounded. And I said, I'm not going to ground you. I said, I'm going to tell you why that was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Here, Here are the reasons that wasn't a good idea. And here's where that could have gone really, really wrong. But am I going to ground you for this? I did this stuff. I would be a total hypocrite if I thought grounding you was going to change anything about what you thought was right or wrong about what you did. And to me, you know, that's this acknowledgement that exactly what you said, they're going to make mistakes. And I made mistakes. I did stupid, stupid things. And I love that that's how you're presenting this to your daughter, that she's going to make mistakes and they're stepping stones. They're, They're ways to learn about the people around them, about their community, about themselves. Oh, that's awesome. Sometimes, I think we sometimes give um, not only our children, we give especially our youth today in our society. We we give them this 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 standard that we never live by, right? right. We never live by the standard like we never. So like, how could you hold, I understand that your wisdom have given you greater insight into the end road of that decision, but still all in all, we cannot come in in a condescending way. We have to find a way to use that level of empathy as well, but help them with an understanding, give them some strategies. And unfortunately, especially when we're talking about our society, when it comes down to the criminal justice system, we see some of these young people being sentenced and penalized for some very, like, very adolescent decision making. You know, we look at the number of young people that are incarcerated in the juvenile facilities. It's mind blowing when you think about how many people are arrested and sent to jail at 13 years old for a juvenile activity. So for me, I just think that our society have to begin to, you know, understand that the same standard you hold, we created laws, but we were 13 years old as well. Who didn't ever really go into a grocery store and steal some candy out of or did some spray painted something or vandalized something. I understand we can't 
create a lawless society, but I am saying that our standards of how we raise young people today, we have to really look back at it because we now send them into these places called juvenile facilities, county jails, and prison. And these environments are not about helping uh, shape them into becoming better people and more responsible people. It is an environment that continues to reinforcing our criminal thinking because now you got a hundred people where they define as delinquent and you don't give them the tools, guess what happens? Now you're going to start converting people into that thinking. And now you're creating and releasing people with a delinquent mindset versus understanding that that mistake was an adolescent mistake. Let me give you some steps uh, to help you move through this in a different way. And that's just my thing with um, the whole whole system. Because I share this with you. I was 17 years old um, and I got caught for selling drugs in school. At 17. And I was sentenced to a 90 day shock probation thing, a uh, prison sentence. And I and I always ho- I always tell people that I believe that that was a defining moment for me at 17. And the way I say it was a defining moment, because no one never took the step back to ask me the question, what happened at 17 to make me make that behavior choice? My mom's died four months before I got arrested at 17. Me and my mom's had an argument or a disagreement about me washing dishes at a 16-year-old state, at 16 year rebel. I didn't want to wash this when I got off of school. I wanted to immediately go outside and play with my friends. My mom's, you know, I uh, didn't wash the dishes until I came back in the house. She told my father I got disciplined for that. And I went to bed upset with my mom's. Now I realized my, I knew that my mom was sick. I didn't know the severity or the level of her sickness. The next morning I woke up, my dad said, hey, I need you to stay home. I want to come back in an hour or so after work, you know, just go to do some stuff at work. And I'm going to come back and take your mom to the hospital. Because, again, we didn't know my mom was the woman that hold a lot of stuff. And she didn't tell us how sick she was. So I left and went to school. My dad said he wanted me being I was the oldest um, sibling to stay home. I was like, no, I'm not staying home. So I literally walked out of the house that morning, didn't say anything to my mom. Three hours later, I got a call and said, your mom's had died. Right. When, wow. I picked me up, when I got in the car parking lot, the school parking lot, he said that my mom's died. I ent- I became extremely numb from that day um, in March. I became numb of that pain. And I lived with the, the guilt that my mom's died. I felt like my mom's died upset with me. So from 16 to about 25, 26 years old, I carried that weight like a 30 pound that's mm. every day struggling, punishing myself. So when I got arrested at 17, the only thing that 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 sentence required me to do is go to a military boot camp. And they in, in that environment, they just wanted to like drill me, PT me. I was doing a bunch of push ups, jumping jack sit ups, don't talk, stand in the line, march, sing caters, et cetera, et cetera. But that wasn't the thing I needed. Right. So I, I was immediately stuffing even more stuff in and, and never really resolving. So that's, again, why I'm so passionate about working with young people, because I felt like that the prison system was set up at that time to really begin to question, have the question, that inquisitive mind, like, why? Instead of mm-hmm. an issue, I would have never got in a situation at 19 years old. If someone would have gave me the safe space to share how I felt, My father, he was a man that didn't really ask that question either because he processed it differently. My father was from that era when men don't cry, men don't communicate their feelings, men don't bring people into your house or counseling and none of that stuff. So here it is, his young son, 16 years old, trying to process the death of his mother. No one talked to me about it. It was like, okay, we bury her within a couple of days and we have to, we have to act like it's normal, but it was not normal for me. You know, it was not normal for my three other sisters, but unfortunately for me, because it was not normal for me, I gravitated into my environment and I started finding other ways to lash out and to release. So that's why I truly believe like when we think about the standard that we hold young people today, why punish some of these young people only require a conversation and not just one, but multiple follow-ups until they're able to trust you to be able to share with them what really bothers them. So 17 years old, I felt like so many things failed me as a 17 year old. And that's why I do the work that I do now, because I don't want another young person to be in a situation where I was at 17. If just one person had come to you and and asked you, like, this isn't your normal behavior. What, What happened? What's going on with you? Just one person. 
it's might what, have might have made the difference. Yeah, you never know. I mean, you know, and it's and 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 it was like not just one, but I think it's important that we know that trust has to be built as an adult. Now, when I work with young people today, I know that my one conversation is not going to change your life. I am not Jesus. I am not Moses. I'm not that powerful. Well, it might. You might plant the seed, but yeah, you you're a seed. lot more likely to nurture that seed if you have more than one conversation. Yeah, I can plant the seed and leave. You can leave me, but I have to follow up. See, Jesus and these, yeah. these men, they can just speak and change people's hearts today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. Like, the thing is, there are the one time conversations that plant the seed that can change your life. And, and um, you're just more likely to have a sustainable change if that continues, if there is the, the follow-up. If, if you had one teacher who went to bat for you, who advocated for you at that time to say, okay, this is what's going on in his life. Let, let's find a different option than sending him to prison. But yeah. Oh, that's just so heartbreaking. And it makes me angry. I, I mean... I can imagine that it took you a while to not be angry about it and to focus that as um, service to work with young people. Well, it took me some time to really process it. You know, it took me, like I said, from 19, from 17 to about 26 years old. I was at this time, 26 years, I was in prison serving life. And because of the work that I started doing on myself, I started like doing that where it, it, it removed a lot of the blockage, the emotional blockage and allow me to start perceiving and seeing things differently. And and that came from me now taking a step back because I truly believe that in order for me to be the adult, I have to heal the, the, the young person, that child, that teenager that felt broken and abandoned. I have mm-hmm. to heal him. Right. So that's where when I started going back to say, here it is at 26 years old, I'm in prison for life and I'm working on myself as an adult. Where do I need to begin? Not just in that moment, because many, most people, they focus on doing the external work and change a few things. And they say, well, I'm healed. And they find months later, there's another trigger that pulls back because you didn't go to the core. And most people, depending upon the pain of what they experience as young people, they never really want to go back there. So in, all, in reality, they really don't really heal. So I knew for me, I need to go back as far as I can to recall what was that thing that put me on that path, what shaped that that callousness and what shaped that type of level of I don't care about life. Right. So the had, disconnection. Yeah. Right. So I disconnected. So I needed to, I needed to remove that. So I went back to my 16 year old kid. I went back to that 16 year old kid and I have a conversation with him. And that conversation was just being able to rebuild him, rebuild his confidence so that he can stand with me at the 26 year old level where here's I'm, tw- I'm 49 now. I don't have 16 year old issues. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And so many people do. And that's actually, that's the work that I love to do with people is uncover that story, that origin story yeah. and yeah. talk about, well, okay. Now you're a fly on the wall. You're observing the 16 year old kid who just lost his mother. Mm-hmm. What kind of compassion can you give to that kid? And, and compassion for the people around that kid who didn't do what they should have done because they were in weird places. I mean, you you gave that to your dad. You gave your dad that grace to say, mm-hmm. this is how he was raised. This is the kind of person he was. He didn't have the capacity to give me what I needed in that moment. So I love this story in so many different levels. And it's still I still have this low level of anger <laughs> that, that nobody reached out, that somebody didn't say, wait. Didn't his mom die four months ago? Maybe, maybe we should be looking at extenuating circumstances here. But at the same time, I'm I'm just so grateful that you had um, Toka, Chaplain Patoka, to bring you that gift to plant that seed that then you're planting for so many, so many hundreds, maybe thousands of others. That just makes me so happy. So it's it's a journey. It's a journey. But that's why going back again to the initial part, your story doesn't define you. I truly believe it doesn't define you. You you have a choice to define it, not it doesn't define you. And it comes again to setting the right intentions and the mindset. You can redefine your story and you can recreate your narrative. And the beauty about us as human beings, like I said, a tree, if a tree doesn't produce the fruits, the tree can't uplift itself and go to another soil, right? <laughs> 
but right. but as human beings you you have that that's one of the beauties of being human beings like you can have a bad season for years but you also have that opportunity to make a few adjustments in your life and you can turn a bad season into a good season by just some intentional things about yourself so that's just mm-hmm. the uniqueness that God has given us as human beings that you may bear a lot of bad fruits in one season in your life, but that one season doesn't define your tree. You, you know what I mean? You have that yeah. ability to re, reinvent yourself, recreate yourself multiple times. You see it every day. You know, and I tell people one of the, I have a lot of people that I look at when I talk, think about this model, but I think about like a Mike Tyson right now, you know, um, I'm really in awe about Mike Tyson's story and how he came from so much trauma from, trauma to becoming one of the one of one of the best boxers in history right but then he lost it all he he lost everything but then now you look at Mike Tyson he's a completely different person but we can see it from the abuse that he experienced as a child to teenager to someone mentoring him helped them become the best boxer in the world heavyweight title went to prison came out of prison, tried to start his life all over again, had this a trauma triggered and all this stuff, had a meltdown. And now what is he doing now? He has reinvented himself. Now he's a he's not that hated person no more because he began to make some small shifts in his life to put him at a different level at his at a, a later part of his life. So that's just the beauty of human beings is that we have that no matter how many fruits that you beard in your bat in one season of your life, doesn't define the other seasons going forward. What defines that is the choices and the work that you put into yourself that would mm-hmm. define the seasons. So we're not defined by our past by no means. We wouldn't have any fruit trees left. <laughs> we all be rotten bananas. If we cut apples. them down after one bad season. No, seriously. I mean, think about the, the metaphor here. We have a hundred year old apple tree in our yard. Mm-hmm. And this season, it didn't bear fruit. We had like six apples and the deer mostly ate them. So we didn't really get any apples. Last year, we were inundated with apples. They were delicious. We made everything apple you can imagine and still gave away hundreds of apples to our friends and neighbors. Mm-hmm. But if we cut down that tree because it had a bad year, wow. I mean, think about it. it's over a hundred years old. How many great seasons is it going to have versus a season or two where it doesn't bear fruit. I just, I love that analogy. That's just so meaningful to me as I I think about autumn. (laughs) Like when you look at that and a lot of people don't see that, but that's, 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 that's it. So as human beings, we want to have some bad seasons in our lives, but the uniqueness about us is that we don't have to, unfortunately people tie us to that bad season. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we have to recognize as a global community that we have to open our eyes to the potential of people changing. And that doesn't mean that we have to trust Mike Tyson alone in an elevator with us, right? Like I'm never going to be alone in an elevator with Mike Tyson. And (laughs) and I don't have to, right? I don't have to trust him to that extent, but I do have to open my heart to consider Mm -hmm. that there has been a significant change in that human being. Yeah. especially somebody that I've never met, especially, right? And you're thinking about it on this level. You think about the 2.3 million people that are currently in prison, right? Yeah. And they, some of them committed crimes when they were 16 years old and they're now 40, 50 years old. Like, yeah. like how much more do a person have to show you at 16, 17 years old in prison for 40 years, right? And some people of the certain thinking and, and belief system is that this person still have not changed. Nah, that's not true. Like, no, people, they definitely change. It's studies have shown people age out of crime, right? The older you get, you're not going to be like, if you get out of prison at age of 50, 60 years old, you're trying to rob a bank, something wrong with you emotionally. Like, <laughs> there's, there's something wrong with you, right? Yeah. You have yeah. To do another assessment or evaluation, but studies have shown <laughs> individuals actually age out of crime. And we have to understand that. So when we think about like people are being denied for parole because of the nature of their crime that they committed 20, 20 years, 30 years ago, something's wrong with that for me. And that's another reason why I advocate, because I believe that we have to start seeing people as human beings, that people do evolve, that their mistake, their worst mistake doesn't mm-hmm. define them. Imagine the person who's making the judgment. Imagine if we had a, a flashlight to show up all of the mistakes that they have made 
you wouldn't be able to do it. That's why I say, oh, you were gone without sin, cast the first stone, right? We understand that this person definitely may not be a person that you want to have in your home. I get that. But to say that this person has not changed, that is not true. People change. It is it is a mm-hmm. fact, right? Logically, their bodies change, their, their minds, things, people change. Science supports this. So why are we mm-hmm. still attaching people to the worst mistake that they've made in their lives? It's just the human, the human nature part of us is we're very judgmental about it. You know, mm-hmm. we judge people based upon that because we have the power of choices, right? But people are not the same people. And I'm so thankful that that the parole board in South Carolina did not use my worst mistake at 19 years old to be a defining thing that will keep me in prison for the rest of my life. Cause I had a 3% chance of ever being free again. Cause most people who are sentenced to life in prison end up dying in prison or they don't get out at, at an age where they can actually do what I'm doing right now. They may get out after 40 years. So I was favored to get out of prison. I got friends right now. I've done 30 years in prison at 19 years old, same, same life, same experience. They're in prison at 30 years old and they're only being denied because someone said that they did not change. Well, that could be a whole other topic. <laughs> the brain science, the neuroscience be- behind change and prison experience and, and the justice system and how messed up it is. So Let's have that maybe, maybe, maybe we'll have that conversation in a year or so and see where that's gone in terms of all your policy work. Cause that, that's what I was reading about too, about your, your policy work. But this Lester, this has been such an enlightening and insightful conversation, and you've really had me thinking about people changing and and what kind of um, seeds we can plant to guide them in that change, to believing them in their change. And the thing that stuck with me the most in this conversation, this whole idea of you not giving up because you had purpose. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm still imagining you standing that and standing there in that library meeting room with no one else in there and not giving up and, and knowing that you were going to serve a purpose one way or another, even if it wasn't on that day. So Lester, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me and spending time with me. And for our listeners, um, where can they get a hold of you, your book? How do you want our listeners to get in touch with you? Uh, please just go to my website, path, the number two redemption.org. And you can find me in any way. You can send me a message. You can see where my books, you can see previous podcasts, uh, different things that I'm doing in the community, speaking engagements and stuff like that. So go to path, the number two redemption.org. And you can just connect me with me on LinkedIn, social media, the various social media platforms. Great. Thank you. And for our listeners, you don't have to stop this recording and, and go back to it. I will have all of this information in the show notes associated with this podcast episode um, on elkinsconsulting.com. Thank you again, Lester. I so appreciate your time. Cool. Be blessed. Thank you. Bye. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you.